Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of LF Networking's webinar series. Uh, my name is Jill, and I am your host. Today, uh, today's webinar is entitled Building CNFs with FIDO VPP and Network Service Mesh. Um, our speakers are Milan Len Lencho and uh, Pavel Kotacek, uh, both with Pantheon, Pantheon Tech. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, both of our, our the attendee, attendee microphones are going to be muted throughout the presentation. However, there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to click on that screen and enter your question. Um, and following the presentation, we will have some time for open Q&A as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Milan. OK, thank you, Jill. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so as it has been explained, uh, I will be presenting the first part of this webinar. Uh, first, I will introduce the, the concept of cloud native network functions. Uh, then I will talk about technologies that we use to build and wire CNFs, uh, such as VPP, Ligato, and NSM. And the core of the first half of the presentation will be about our more recent, most recent work of integrating NSM with Ligato. And then I will show you how it works with a pre-recorded demonstration. And then uh, my colleague Pavel, uh, he will show you how you can use IOVisor uh, eBPF traceability to get insights into your VPP-based CNF deployments. Uh, okay, so first thing first, what is CNF? Uh, so CNF is an abbreviation of uh, cloud native network function. So uh, it is basically a software implementation of a network function uh, like uh, uh, router, switch, uh, gateway, and so on, uh, that follows some cloud native principles. So for example, uh, one principle is um, statelessness, uh, which is a separation of uh, data storage from application code, uh, which then simplifies scalability, um, fault tolerance, and recovery. Oh, sorry. Uh, the next one is a microservice architecture, uh, which says that basically uh, each CNF should be minimalistic, performing only performing only a single function, and then by wiring multiple CNFs, we, we get a complex functionality of a network appliance. And then an another important principle uh, of cloud native functions is uh, declarative APIs. And these declarative APIs basically improve, um, for example, configuration validation, uh, recovery, and uh, rollback. Uh, so CNFs are commonly packaged as containers, uh, which makes them both portable and lightweight. And uh, as network appliances uh, get decoupled into many CNFs, um, an automatic orchestration becomes necessity and technologies such as Kubernetes or Red Hat OpenShift are used as the solution. And to build more complex network functions, CNFs need to be uh, wired together. And in the area of networking, there are typically uh, separate connections for management of CNFs and for the data point traffic. So that means that CNF typically have more than one interface. Uh, and the simplest topology of CNF interconnection is called uh, is chain. Uh, it's commonly referred to as uh, service function chaining or SFC uh, for short. So uh, CNFs are not uh, some kind of revolution, but a natural evolution, basically. So first we had physical appliances. So uh, standalone physical machines combining proprietary hardware with proprietary software. So that's not very flexible and often very expensive. Uh, but then virtualization allowed us to view hardware um, not just as individual machines, but rather as a pool of computational resources. Uh, so um, we basically could use uh, community hardware with a host operation system and a virtualization layer to build infrastructure uh, where each network function uh, is implemented and deployed as a single uh, virtual machine. 
and these virtual machines are orchestrated by some SDN solution. And then if we continue um, decoupling uh, and make network functions even lighter using containers, uh, containers as opposed to VMs can be instantiated uh, in, in seconds since they share a common operation system. And uh, as we apply those already mentioned cloud native principle, stateless nice microservice architecture and declarative APIs, uh, we get to even more flexible cloud native architectures uh, here in these pictures shown on the right side. So that's where we are uh, heading towards. Uh, right, so first technology that I would like to talk about uh, uh, in, the, in this context of cloud native functions uh, is VPP. So uh, for us, VPP uh, is a data plane of primary choice uh, for a couple of reasons. So for example, uh, it is a vector packet processor and as opposed to scalar packet processor, that means that uh, uh, multiple packets are processed at the same time and that improves instruction and uh, data cache locality and therefore it improves overall in, in, uh, performance. Uh, furthermore, VPP runs fully in user space. Uh, it bypasses kernel uh, even for things like packet acquisition and injection uh, from and to uh, uh, NIX and that uh, accomplishes by using DPDK framework. Uh, it supports multiple hardware architectures, provides implementations of many network protocols. It is programmable and it is easily extensible through, through plugins. And uh, what is important is that recently it has went through some improvements towards being more, um, let's say, cloud native ready. Uh, for example, a so-called MEMIF interface was added, uh, which allows to efficiently uh, exchange packets between VPPs and also other MEMIF enabled processes running on the same host uh, by means of shared memory, uh, therefore completely in user space. And that's very important for efficient efficiency uh, because as we decompose network appliances into many interconnected CNFs, uh, the, the packet exchange uh, between, between CNFs becomes a considerable performance penalty. Uh, okay, so uh, now we have a data plane or one option for data plan, but we also need a control plan for our CNFs. And uh, Ligato is a framework uh, designed just for that. It's designed for building control plan agents for cloud native network functions. Uh, it uses uh, Protobuf from Google to create declarative configuration models and then uses technologies such as Kubernetes, CRDs, gRPC, or even uh, or uh, key value data store like etcd to, to store and then uh, also to submit configuration into CNF. Uh, it is easily extensible via plugins and already provided as a production ready control plane agent for uh, VPP and also for Linux networking. So uh, just to quickly show you the architecture. Uh, so on the top you can see that uh, cloud native technologies like uh, etcd, gRPC, CRD and so on are used to submit declarative configuration into the agent. And things like Kafka or Prometheus are used to publish state data out from the agent. And inside the agent, the configuration is uh, broken down and processed by separate plugins. For example, um, there is a plugin for VPP interfaces or plugin for VPP IPsec or Linux interfaces and so on. And then uh, also inside the Ligato uh, framework core, uh, there is a graph of dependencies maintained to ensure that configuration operations are executed in a valid order. So for example, if you have an interface and a route, a route uh, which in references that interface, then you need to configure the interface first and then the route. Uh, and for, for VPP, uh, data plane, the configuration ch change is, uh, is applied via GoVPP uh, package. And for Linux, uh, you know, changes are performed through uh, Netlink library. And uh, this is uh, extensible even beyond VPP and Linux, as we will see with NSM. Uh, and uh, VPP agent is uh, packaged as container and uh, typically orchestrated by Kubernetes. And, and this agent, this VPP agent itself is already a CNF uh, because it offers declarative API and um, behind it many networking features which are already offered by VPP and Linux. 
So it can be used as is uh, for many applications. Right, so these are uh, some of the uh, technologies of our interest for building CNF, uh, but there is, a, there is a challenge and that is uh, how to wire CNFs together, specifically for networking applications. So uh, there are some existing solution uh, working on the application layer, uh, like uh, service meshes like Linkerd or Istio, but this is often not sufficient for networking where L3 or even L2 connections are needed to, to support the wide variety of network protocols. Uh, and also the requirements for latency and bandwidth uh, of such links are often higher. And finally, another requirement is that separation of control plan from data plane traffic is uh, often preferred. So in other words, multiple network interfaces plugged into containers or, or pods in the Kubernetes are needed. So options are to use CNF, focus CNI, such as ContiVPP uh, that we are also contributing into, or Maltus, which uh, is uh, by default used in OpenShift, which combines multiple CNIs uh, and um, also you need a efficient access to physical interfaces for which you can use the SRIV technology in Kubernetes enabled to the device plugin. And uh, finally uh, listed is a novel solution, uh, which this presentation is focused on and it's called Network Service Mesh or NSM for short. So NSM is a CNCF uh, or Cloud Native Computing Foundation Sandbox project. Uh, it basically provides service mesh functionality, but on L2 and L3 layer. It builds additional connections, uh, network connections between Kubernetes pods. Uh, so this, this is for Kubernetes between Kubernetes pods uh, based on a routing definition submitted via uh, CRD. It, uh, it runs alongside any CNI and creates additional high performance data plan connection. So, uh, so you have the primary interfaces created by uh, CNI, CNI of your choice. And then you have alongside that running C, uh, NSM, which creates additional interfaces. And uh, these, these interfaces are uh, high performance oriented. Uh, it's uh, apart from um, tabs and weeds, uh, it also supports the already mentioned MEMIFs interfaces for VPP based CNFs or, VP or MEMIF enabled CNFs. Uh, the important thing to note is that connections uh, uh, with NSM are initiated from inside CNFs uh, via NSM SDK. And uh, that, that puts some limitations because uh, it means that CNF control plane agents need to be written in Go uh, because there is currently only Go implementation of NSM SDK. And uh, also this SDK based configuration approach uh, kind of breaks that uh, cloud native principle of declarative APIs. Uh, uh, but there is an option to put an already prepared CNF sidecar uh, next to your, for example, some non NSM non ever application, for example, some legacy application not written in Go or uh, legacy application that cannot even be changed. But this sidecar uh, approach has its limitation. For example, uh, the configuration of interfaces cannot be changed in runtime. Um, so NSM obviously supports the, uh, the simplest topology of CNF chain. Here in this picture, we can see CNF1 uh, shown as some uh, NSM native uh, application, which call, uses NSM SDK to request tab interface uh, that goes then into NSM data plan. Then this is connected via L2X connect into MEMIF interface into uh, another CNF, which is also NSM native using SDK, but it is also VPP based. So it supports the MEMIF interfaces uh, and uh, then chain continues uh, through the through the F packets, it gets to the physical interface, through the VXLAN, it gets uh, to another Kubernetes node. And then again, F packet, L2X connect and uh, to tab interface to another CNF tree, which is some here as an example of some non-native, let's say some legacy, uh, network function, which uses uh, sidecar, right? And um, actually NSM supports any topologies, not just chains. Uh, in their in NSM model, uh, some CNFs are advertised as so-called NSM endpoints, uh, being uh, producers of some services and other CNFs are acting as NSM clients consuming those services. So it's a producer consumer uh, kind of uh, approach. 
And then there is a routing defined uh, via CRD, as uh, sh example is shown here on the right side, uh, uh, that then decides for each NSM client to which NSM endpoint it, it should be connected to based on uh, labels which are attached. So, um, so for example, here we have two, two rules. They are also called matches, right? And this, this uh, bottom one, it says that um, NSM client with label uh, app, app equals CNF5 should connect to uh, NSM endpoint advertised with label CNF equals CNF3. And that results in this uh, middle bottom link between CNF5 and CNF3. Um, all right, so uh, that was some introduction of technologies uh, uh, that, that, we, that are involved here. And now the, the work that I'm going to present here, uh, what, we have, what we decided to do uh, was to integrate NSM into Ligato to get all these uh, CNF wiring features from NSM, um, but with cloud native principles, uh, such as the declarative APIs and uh, also the composition of uh, network features into separate plugins uh, as it is provided by Ligato framework. Uh, I will skip to this slide uh, to the diagram to show you on a picture what we did. So basically, uh, we created a new uh, plugin for managing NSM interfaces. Uh, it gets uh, declarative configuration description uh, from, from these APIs uh, and translates that into corresponding uh, uh, sequence of uh, imperative calls into NSM SDK uh, to, to, to get those uh, uh, interfaces created uh, by NSM. Um, and then uh, the, the VPP and, and the Linux uh, features already provided by, by Ligato uh, can then reference these interfaces transparently by their logical names. That means irrespective to how those interfaces were actually created from their point of view, whether it was via NSM or through some other way. So in other words, the already existing Ligato plugins can be used with now supported NSM interfaces without any changes. Uh, I will go back one slide just to show you a link to GitHub repository uh, where the, the code of this uh, NSM interface plugin can be found. Uh, and the combination of Ligato VPP agent together with uh, this NSM interface plugin we call NSM agent. And uh, in the following uh, pre-recorded demo, I will show you uh, how it can be used to, to implement and wire CNFs. So um, source code of the demo, uh, which basically is just a set of YAML files uh, deployed into Kubernetes can be found uh, on this GitHub link. Uh, okay, so uh, let me switch to the pre-recorded demo. Right, so uh, I will pause it here. Uh, so uh, here we have a simple, in this example, we have a simple chain topology to be deployed inside a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so there is, a, in the middle, there is a CNF NAT44. Uh, so that means uh, cloud native network function providing network address translation between private and public IPv4 networks. Uh, and it is wired on, on one side with a client pod uh, with, a, uh, with a private IP address. Uh, and this client is, uh, in this example, is actually a, a Kubernetes pod with a curl tool, uh, curl, Linux curl tool installed inside. And uh, on the other side of CNFNAT44, there, there will be a web server uh, with a pub public IP address, uh, and the web server is actually a uh, another pod with VPP inside. And by the way, VPP provides uh, a HTTP server for testing purposes, so that's what we are going to use. And all these three uh, all these three pods are using uh, NSM agent as as the control plane agent. And uh, here uh, on the left side, we see the YAML file for uh, the definition of the routing for NSM. So it's just two rules. Uh, one, uh, the, the routing is definitely such that VPP web server is an endpoint for CNFNAT44 and CNFNAT44 is an endpoint for the client pod. All right, so I will resume the demonstration. Um, by the way, uh, inside the repository with the demo, there is a uh, readme file, which uh, you, can, you can then follow to try it out for yourself. 
uh, there are uh, also all the steps which I'm going to do uh, explained in detail. Uh, and actually, first couple of steps uh, tell you that you need to have Kubernetes uh, deployed together with NSM, but this has already been done um, before recording. Uh, but but in the readme file, you can find links to to the documentation of Kubernetes and NSM to learn uh, how to deploy each. Right. So now let's start uh, deploying the ML files. There are a couple of them. So. Um, First, we actually need to deploy a CRD controller for our CNFs. Uh, it will be used to receive declarative configuration in a Kubernetes native way. In this, way, in this case, it will be configuration inside the ML files uh, deployed via kubectl. And uh, the controller will just write this uh, configuration into etcd data store, which was already uh, now uh, deployed. And from etcd, the NSM agents will read it. So, uh, this is that uh, cloud native principle of statelessness, uh, separation of state from application code. Uh, that's why the configuration is not submitted into NSM agents directly. Um, so next, once we have CRD controller, we can start deploying our, our CNFs and pods. So first we will deploy web server. Uh, so here, uh, actually inside of its YAML files, you can see the uh, declarative um, configuration, uh, which contains just that NSM endpoint, and it is inside an instance of our CRD. So, so this is the, the, the first part of the ML, files, the ML file. Now, uh, once, the, uh, once we deploy a web server, uh, what happens, you can see on the right side. Uh, so uh, the, the pod is created. Uh, uh, it includes uh, the VPP, which will be our HTTP server, but also uh, NSM agent that uh, receives that configuration. And based on the, that configuration, it will advertise the endpoint to the NSM control plane. Next, we deploy CNF NAT44. Uh, in, in its YAML uh, definition, you can see that there is a uh, definition of the ed endpoint to which the, the client will connect. That there is the NSM client that will connect to the web server. And then there is now highlighted uh, the NAT configuration. And that NAT configuration references those interfaces by, by their logical names. So, so the same NAT configuration could be used regardless of what wiring technology we use. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's NSM. Right, so once uh, this is uh, deployed, uh, the NSM agent of NAT44 uh, will uh, request connection from the NSM control plane. Uh, the NSM control plane will look at the routing and will determine that it should connect to the web server. Both wants MEMIF interface because they are VPP based and uh, it will create those MEMIF interfaces that will connect to each other directly without even having to go through the, the NSM data plane. So it's a very efficient connection in this case. And we can use the VPP CLI to confirm that uh, those interfaces uh, have been already created on both ends. And uh, finally, we will deploy client, client pod with the call. So uh, in its configuration, uh, there is just uh, this uh, NSM client definition that will connect to NCNF NAT44. And also there is a route uh, for HTTP requests to be directed through that interface, through this, basically through this data plane connection rather than going through the primary interface, uh, which is created by CNI. Uh, and so uh, once we deploy the, the client, uh, the, the NSM agent of the client will request connection from the uh, NSM control plane. Uh, the NSM control plane will determine that it should connect to NAT44, but since client is a Linux application, uh, the, the crawl is a Linux app application, it wants tab interface and tab interface cannot be con connected to MEMIF directly. So both client and NAT44 will connect to NSM data plane and there uh, they will be linked together using L2X connect connection. And with that, we have the chain ready. We can test it using the HTTP request sent from the client. Uh, as we can see, uh, we have received the HTTP response from the server. And uh, let's, let's uh, verify it even more. Uh, let's do packet tracing in the web server and see that if those packet indeed goes through the MEMIF, MEMIF interface, 
we will start packet tracing on that MemIF interface. We will rerun the HTTP request and then we will uh, print the captured packets. And first, firstly, we will confirm that we, we have all the, all the packets of the TCP session going through, through this data plan connection. And secondly, we will also verify that the, the IP address of the client, client has been already uh, source noted to the public IP before it reached the web server. Right. Uh, so yeah, so that, uh, that concludes uh, this uh, first part uh, of uh, integration of NSM into Ligato. And, uh, and I, I will pass it to, to my colleague, Pavel, uh, who will show you how you can trace uh, such VPP-based CNF deployments using IOWISOR. Hello, everybody. So uh, next couple of minutes, uh, we will talk about traceability, especially VPP traceability. Uh, as for any other application extensively using processor, it's good to know how it operates, uh, where its bottlenecks are, or why its performance is low. This is where tracing comes into picture. Linux has two well-known tracing tools, S-Trace and L-Trace, allowing you to see what system calls and dynamic library calls are being made. But uh, what do you want to know what happened inside such call? Fortunately, science version four of Linux kernel, there is a Berkeley packet filter, BPF for short. Uh, technology for optimizing packet filtering and on top, on top of this BPF, there is an enhanced BPF, BPF for short, which allows to run on events other than packets and to do action other than packet filtering. Data source for tracing could be a system call, a function call, or even something what happens inside Shari call. Even data can come from kernel or from application in user space. Kernel probes uh, provide dynamic access to internal components in the kernel, and you need to know the function signature that you want to break into. Kernel trace points are needed in case of static access to internal components in the kernel. These trace points are codified by kernel developers when they implement changes in the kernel. User space probes are used in case of dynamic access to programs running in user space. Your statically defined traces, trace points are designed for uh, static access to programs running in user space. And application developer have to manually annotate their code using user statically defined probes. Data from uh, events can be extracted by various applications as perf, uh, system tab, and also including enhanced BPF. And to display result, responses or logs, uh, there is a, a variety of front-end tools, including BCC and BPF trace. In the next, uh, we will focus on eBPF. EBPF is a register-based virtual machine using a custom 64-bit instruction set, and it is uh, capable of running just-in-time native compiled BPF programs inside a Linux kernel. Enhanced BPF is full virtual machine implementation, so not to be confused with uh, kernel-based virtual machine. And all its interaction with user space happen through eBPF maps, which are key value stores. By design, eBPF virtual machine and its programs are intentionally not turning complete. It means there are no loops allowed. And so each BPF program is guaranteed to finish and not hang. The main, the main and recommended front end for BPF tracing are BCC and BPF trace. BPF compiler com collection, BCC for short, provides a large collection of tracing tools for developing kernel tracing and manipulation programs. BPF trace is a high level front end for BPF tracing, which uses libraries from BCC. Uh, BPF trace is uh, ideal for ad hoc instrumentation with uh, powerful customer, uh, custom one-liners 
and uh, short scripts, whereas BCC is suited for complex tool and daemon. Uh, here is a BPF program work, work, workflow diagram, and we can see that uh, at first, uh, BCC generates bytecode from user program. Then user space sends bytecode to kernel, where it is verified and compiled to native code and inserted at specific code location. And finally, kernel sent measured data back to the user. On the left side, there is a set of uh, Linux events supported by eBPF and a set of various tools on the right side. All these tools are available on IWISE or GitHub web page. On this web page, IWISE or GitHub, there are plenty of examples of BPF one-liners and scripts. An example of script code is here on the left side and also BCC tools on the right side. Reference guide to write BCC tool and BPF trade script can be found on iWizard GitHub also. And now we will demonstrate using of BPF probes in BPP. Again, we, I have pre-recorded video as Milan, so uh, we, can, uh, we can first talk about what we will see and then we will demonstrate it. At first, we can check and list existing probes on our system using BPF trace tool. Uh, we can also check a uh, count of system calls performed by given process using this kernel trace point. And also we can uh, check number of uh, file system reads using kernel probe with return value. So now, now let's do it on our system. So first we will list a trace point which contains some string because there is a lot of uh, trace points uh, in, the, in, uh, in my system. As you can see, there are uh, more than 40,000 uh, 40, trace points. Now we can uh, check number of system calls by process using trace uh, kernel trace point. So let it run for a while and then we have to stop it to see results. And finally, we can uh, run a kernel probe to see a number of calls, read function on the file system. Again, let it run for a while and then we have to stop it and, to, and we, will see, we can see a histogram uh, with results. Now we can start tracing of BPP using eBPF. As Milan mentioned, uh, BPP is fast open source vector packet processing data plane framework. BPP has a set of CLIs and APIs to configure it and to retrieve status, as well as information from BPP. And so using eBPF, we can trace interface counters, uh, interface state changes, node statistics, uh, neighbor table updates, uh, routing table updates, not session creation, deletion, deletion update, and, and much more. In our tracing tool, we use user statically defined trace point because, as Milan said, VPP is completely running in user space. And uh, the reason to use US, user statically defined trace point is that most of VPP function return just void. Uh, error code or complex structure, so using user probe is useless. And in every place where we want to do a probe, we fire a system tab probe uh, using this macro. And in macro, we provide name of uh, name of uh, provider, which is in our case VPP. Name of probe in our case is VNet Software Interface State Probe and arguments for this probe. These arguments are, uh, can be uh, read later on using BCC or BPF trace tool. An, exam an example how to trace our probe using uh, BPF trace tool uh, written in Python is on this image. Here is a tool, definition of probe, uh, 
path to the probe. In our case, it is shared library, name of the probe, and arguments which are which we are interested in. The same we can we can do using high level uh, language BPF trace and its script. Here is an example how this script uh, should look like. As you can see, it is pretty short. And here again is defined uh, type of probe. In our case, it's the user statically defined probe, name of uh, shared library, and so on. So now let's uh, check it in in our code in our application. So first, we have to run uh, VPP. And now we can use uh, BCC tool to list probes in VPP shared library. As you can see, in one of VPP's library, it's really the library, there is a set of uh, probes. There is another library, VNet, which also contains some probes. And finally, one example of plugin is not plugin, and here is a set of probes in this plugin. And now let's uh, let's try interface, interface state changes in VPP using BCC tool. Here is the first example we saw in picture and using this BPF uh, script, the second one. So now we have to create interface in VPP. Let's create it. And as you can see, immediately we can output of the probe. This is using BCC tool. So it is not formatted, it is just as it is provided, but using our script, we can format and provide also name, name as example. Now we can change interface state from up to down, uh, sorry, from down to up, and you can see changes in both outputs. If you switch it down, you can see again change in, in the output. So finally, we would like to present our complex tool, which combines output from all probes we have inserted to VPP yet in one screen. It combines uh, data plane changes, control plane changes. So you can see all interface state error and node statistic and all outputs uh, from control plane performed by CLI or, or API. First, uh, we have to create. Uh, first, we have to create two pods running uh, VPP, and here is a configuration file for both uh, pods. One is named VPF1, and the second one is VPF2. Now let's start. Uh, let's start these pods, and uh, we can connect to VPP consoles using. VPP tool, and here you are. We are connecting to VPF1 and to VPF2 again in, in another console. And now let's start two instances of VPF tracing tool, one on VPF1 node or pod, and uh, one on VPF2 pod. As you can see, probes are attached in a few seconds. And now we can create a, a interface and see outputs in this tool. So one interface is created, it stayed down. Now assign IP address to it and we can see probe which, which was invoked and their, para, their arguments. We can change uh, state to up, and then we can change, we can add neighbor to, to this interface. As you can see, two probes were invoked by one CLI command. Uh, let's do something more complex on the pod number one. We have, I have prepared script which, which uh, will create a more complex topology. So there are two interfaces, both have IP addresses. Uh, there is a NAT feature enabled on interface PG0. And there is also packet generator script which will, which will generate 100 
packets with source destination and uh, with source and destination IPs and source and destination port. This script can be simply executed on VTP. So all commands have been executed at once and you can see changes on, on interface state and also what IPs and, and so on have been assigned to interfaces. Now let's simulate traffic using packet generator. I'm sorry. And here, here you can see that 100 packets have been sent using uh, packet generator and one NAT session has been created. Finally, we can configure interface on running VPP in Docker and uh, to use ping tool to check connectivity. So we have started VPP and we are trying to do ping, but there is no response as VPP has no interface assigned it, uh, con uh, configured. Let's start our tracing, uh, BPF tracing tool. It, it is trying to attach to running BPP. Uh, once it is configured, we can, once it is started, we can configure BPP that we will create one interface, uh, switch it up, uh, assign IP address, and uh, also enable for communication. We can simply execute uh, this script on uh, running BPP. You can see changes here. And now when we are uh, pinging this IP address, there is response is coming and you can see that VPP is processing packets and you can increasing number of packet processed by given interface. Here is 10 packets sent as there are 10 pings. This concludes the second part of presentation, the VPP traceability using BPF and uh, now Milan will give some final words. Okay, thank you, Pavel. All right, so uh, this was our demonstration of building CNFs with VPP and network service mesh, uh, also with some VPP traceability in cloud native deployments. And uh, here on this slide, uh, there is a summary of what we do in Pantheon Tech. Uh, we of course welcome any contributions and, and cooperation in all, in all of those open source projects that were mentioned. And uh, lastly, uh, I would like to thank, uh, or we would like to thank the Linux Foundation for giving us the opportunity to, to share this demonstration with you. And uh, of course, uh, thank you to everybody, everyone who participated. And uh, if you would like to keep in contact with us, um, make sure to find us on all major social networks uh, as, you can, uh, as we have written them on this uh, last slide. So thank you. And now, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Great, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate this great presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions and if you have any more uh, folks on the line, uh, there is a Q&A window at the bottom of the screen. So feel free to type in your question there. Um, so we'll go through a couple of these um, first. Uh, we did get asked, is there any performance penalty of using network service mesh? Uh, right, so um, as, it has been, as it has been shown uh, in the uh, picture, uh, which was uh, included in the demonstration, uh, NSM consists of uh, some components, and uh, there is the data plane component, which by default is VPP, uh, run on each Kubernetes node. So obviously VPP is uh, like, you can say CN, uh, CPU oriented um, packet processing. So it requires some computational resources. Uh, uh, but it, as uh, like the, the reward is a uh, higher performance. So if you have those computational resources, it's, uh, it's a good choice. But uh, if you are limited there and you don't need the best uh, networking performance, then you can uh, change the configuration of NSM to use a kernel, kernel-based uh, data plan, which it also supports. And uh, with kernel networking, uh, it is, uh, um, basically uh, less uh, less demanding uh, on the computational resources, uh, but the, the price is that the, the network connections will be a bit slower. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are there any alternatives to network service mesh? Well, uh, as it has been mentioned, like uh, to create additional uh, connections for, for data plane between 
uh, between CNFs and, and pods in Kubernetes pods in general. You can, for example, use uh, the already mentioned Conti VPP, uh, which is very similar to NSM in that it also uses VPP uh, to, to wire CNFs. Uh, but Conti VPP is also a CNI, so even for primary interfaces, you you can have you know the VPP based connections. So um, you know it's uh, it's your choice basically if you if you want uh, like any CNI, if you have some requirements for specific CNI, or if uh, you are okay with using uh, you know specific CNF oriented CNI, and then you can use Conti VPP. Great, thank you. Um... Where does the NSM store the configuration? Well, uh, so uh, the NSM follows this uh, cloud native principle of statelessness. Uh, so it uh, stores the configuration into CRD. So, so not locally next to the application code or into some file, but uh, like uh, separately uh, into, into CRD. Uh, and and so yeah, then that makes it suitable for for cloud native deployments, as it can handle. Therefore, it can handle uh, restarts very well. And okay, migration. Okay, great. Well. And where <clears throat> where would somebody go to find the code? Uh, yeah. So so uh, so for uh, Legato, uh, there is a link in the presentation for the Legato code. Uh, for NSM, uh, there is a linked uh, web page, uh, network service mesh.io, which uh, links you to GitHub repository. And also, the, there are links for, for this uh, integration of NSM with Legato, also included in the presentation. And also, the, these examples, uh, are, uh, which we have demonstrated here, uh, are in a repository, also uh, can be found in, in this presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Milan. Um, it looks like our next set of questions are specific to Pavel's part about tracing. Um, so somebody's asking why or when should I use BFT trace instead of VPP CLI? Yeah, the reason to use BFT trace is that uh, you can annotate any piece of code uh, you would like to, to trace instead of uh, CLI, which provides just a defin definite number of uh, commands. And uh, moreover, CLI provides output for given command only. And as you saw in presentation, when you do some changes in VPP, there are two probes uh, invoked and using CLI, you will never got this output. This output. So it, it uh, do much better tracing uh, information as CLI. Okay, thank you. Um, and then it looks like we just have one more question here. Um, do I need a special VPP build to be able to use BPF probes? Sure, it has to be a special build because uh, we are using uh, user statically defined trace point, which as I said, should be used to annotate code, so you have to build your own build and uh, insert these uh, trace points and you can then trace uh, application. So yes, it is necessary to build your own version. Got it. Okay, well, unless I don't think we have any more questions, so I think that concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much to our presenters and thank you to everyone for joining us today. And we hope to see you on an upcoming LFN webinar soon. Have a great day.